Welcome to Shelly's Game Kitchen in Montana. I'm so excited to have you here in my home in the Bitterit Valley, and I'm gonna show you so many new and exciting things with wild and pure game meat this season. Plus, I get to show you wonderful vistas in the landscape of my hometown in the Bitterit Valley, Montana. So keep watching, stick around for a new season of Shelly's Game Kitchen, where I bring the forest to your table. Thank you for back, coming back to this episode of Shelly's Game Kitchen. I'm Chef Shelly Meyer, and I'm here with Lauren Carnop. And you and your husband, Justin, have a fly rod company called CD Fishing USA, correct? Yes. And then you also have a podcast. I do. What's that called? The February Room. Wonderful. What do you talk about on your podcast? Fly fishing. Not, so. Well, of course. You have a fly rod company. You're going to talk about fly I fishing. I know. Well, in this one, we interview guests and talk about their fishing stories and their journey. So from fishing guys to nonprofits to just your next door neighbor who has a great fishing story. Awesome, wonderful. So what we're gonna do with this episode is we're actually doing an invasive species that was caught in the bitterroot, right? Yes. Nice. It's northern pike. So a lot of people will catch it, you know, they're so familiar with trout and they want to just think about trout and catch trout and there's a lot of catch and release, but we actually can really enjoy the northern pike. It's a flaky white fish, so if you think about the technique for flaky white fish, it makes it easy to be able to go ahead and enjoy that fish and it helps to alleviate some of that invasive species in our rivers in Montana. Yes, Correct. Absolutely. Okay. So what we're going to do today is called Fish Veracruz. So we're going to kind of uh, layer some fish with some pickled jalapenos, some green olives and garlic and top with some capers and some white wine with some onion in there and we'll layer it all and then pop it in the oven. But I always use with my fish, I use my Montana flavor to savor fish seasoning. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but smell this. Oh my gosh, yeah, that smells almost like a barbecue. Yeah, there's of, a little yeah. bit of smokiness in yeah, there. Yeah, totally. It is my second popular, the steak seasoning is the number one popular, but the fish is actually gaining ground on top of the steak because yeah. it's so versatile. It works on anything. It's gonna be great with this pike. So let's get started cooking and I'll, I'll show you how we're gonna layer this out. And while we're doing that, tell me a little bit more about the um, fly rod company. Well, um, we're the North American fly rod distribution for them. And what we do is we get the rods from New Zealand and that's always really fun. Yeah, to kind of go through customs, you get to. But they finally come to our hands, and so we um, we sell them online. But we also have fly shops um, in the country that okay. is, that holds our fly rods. Nice. Yeah. So on your podcast, have you talked to any kind of really interesting people? What's one one of your most? Yes. Oh, gosh. There's so many. Um, one of uh, talking about pike. I had uh, John McLean come on the podcast, Norman McLean's son, who uh, wrote the book A River Runs Through It. Oh my goodness. And John just We came all know up. that, right? Yeah. Well, everyone thinks about Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt, yeah. But if you haven't read the book, you need to revisit A River Runs Through It, because it's probably one of the most um, amazing writing and poetry that you can read. Absolutely. But John just came out with a book, Home Waters, which kind of goes more into the historical. Uh, um, but anyways, he talks about Pike. 
And so about the invasive species and, um, you know, he's, they still have their cabin up in Sealy Lake. And oh, wow. so, yeah, it's That's just really fantastic. cool. And just how their family tradition is really still rooted in uh, Montana. That's he fantastic. A great person to talk to. I've had uh, some great fishing guides. And the fishing guides have great fishing stories. Oh, totally. They, the best fishing the, story. It's the fishing story that goes, you know. <laughs> but the best fishing story is actually the story that you don't catch any fish, right? It's right. the one that went totally wrong. Like, I can't remember the biggest fish that was caught, but I can remember the person who went out the night before and their waders got full <laughs> or something else. But you know, like, it's those stories that yes. like, kind of reminisce, like, what fishing is all about. It's nice. Just like, yeah. So are you a fly fisher woman yourself? Yes. Yep, I do. Um, What's your favorite, you have one of the rods. Is there a favorite one of the rods? You, you told me earlier that you have several different ones. Is there a favorite yeah. one that you like um, for yourself? I love our ICT rod. Okay. It's, um, what I like about it is I'm kind of a person that likes to feel things and the ICT yes. helps me feel my back cast so I can know when my line straightens out okay. to extend it. And so, yeah, this past, um, my favorite fish to catch is smallmouth. So we have Ooh. a family cabin in Northern Wisconsin and I swear those fish, they're like little football. They are, it's they so actually, much fun. yeah. So if you look on my wall over there, there's a little smallmouth. So oh, my husband okay. talked about it and he said it was actually the toughest yes. fish. They, they just fight, and that's a relatively small one. Yes. But they fight like they're 20 pounds. Obsessed. Yeah, Justin, he's traveled the world because he used to work on a show called Fly Fishing the World. And so oh, wow. okay. he was able to kind of go fishing. So I've still only stayed states. Like I've only been to like Wisconsin and Montana and Oregon. So I'm kind of looking forward to expanding my fishing destinations. Definitely. Tarpon is definitely one of the ones I'd love to okay. catch. So. It's kind of like the, the, the fishing, sorry, my rice is, yeah. I hear my pot lid popping back there. <laughs> I've got the rice already started because we're gonna serve this with a cilantro lime rice. What I've done here is I've just kind of layered a bay leaf on the bottom with a little olive oil and, and then we're layering onion, sliced onion, sliced tomato, the fish, seasoning each layer. The fish I'm seasoning with just the fish seasoning and then the tomatoes and, and onion, I'll uh, flavor with a little salt and fresh cracked pepper. And we're just gonna kind of layer along and then um, again do a second layer on top. And so this is one of those dishes that as a private chef, um, I do this dish for my clients, but it's not one that you can really do in advance. So many, like when I private chef, I'll do a couple of meals that go in the fridge for them to, to heat up or finish off from raw the next day or whatever when I'm not there. And this is not one of those dishes because of all of the acid, you can't, leave this for the next day. Okay. <laughs> this is definitely one of those dishes that you need to cook it off right away. Otherwise your fish will get completely mealy um, from all the acid. You're, you've made ceviche and it went too long. <laughs> well, and I'm so curious, Shelly. So I saw you had the bay leaves on the very yes. bottom. What is, what is that? So, I've never seen that before. Oh, nice. So what we're gonna do in the end is I'm gonna drizzle some white wine over the top. And that bay leaf is going to actually steam in there with the white wine and give more of that wonderful laurel notes to the dish. Noted. So anytime you do something that's um, sauce based mm -hmm. or uh, casserole based, bay leaf is one of those little hidden things that actually accentuate. It gives a floral note and on white flaky fish, I love it. Okay. So that's what that was. So now we're just gonna layer in again with our, our next layer. And when you have cut tomatoes, this is where the bottom layer is where you wanna use your not so pretty ones. <laughs> the top layer, you wanna use your pretty slices. So I've hidden those uglier ones in the bottom and let's just kinda of top this off with some pretty slices. And then we'll layer everything back in and we'll top everything off like I said. We're done with that. And it already smells super amazing. Good. I can just smell like the, the tomatoes yes. and that little smoke that you just put on there. It smells delicious. So yeah, the so the tomatoes, I don't know if you, I love tomatoes. Yes. But one of the secrets, if you don't have really, really fresh tomatoes, is if you cut them and salt them and salt then them. let them sit out for just a minute, 
the salt actually brings that freshness, like they're fresh picked. So it's one of those little things that you can do to get a little bit better flavor on those, maybe not so fresh picked, not so ripe tomatoes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, it's one of those chef things. Let's salt your tomatoes, cut them, salt them, and kind of, it's not, you're not macerating them, but you're letting the, the juices kind of come out of the tomato a little bit and helps develop the tomato flavor. So we always want to make sure you salt a little bit on your tomato. Not too much because you're not trying to leach the, the liquids out, but you want to have some good flavor. Okay, so now I want to hear more about some of your fly fishing. You, have you gone to, so you said tarpon is one of your... Yep, yep, it's one of my places I would love to go and catch yeah. tarpon. It where where would you go for tarpon? I mean, Florida, the okay, Keys. Okay, okay. Maybe, I don't know, somewhere nice and warm. <laughs> so, you know, let's go somewhere tropical. I will do that with you. <laughs> the reason why it's called the February Room, the podcast, is because we get this question a lot, is because as you can attest, February in <laughs> Montana, in Montana it gets dark and dreary. And so my husband has a fly tying room and in February he'd always go down there. So I just kept calling it the February room. Like, oh, oh my gosh, and I love so, that. And um, so the idea behind the February room is it's a place where you can tie flies, think about memories from, uh, fishing memories from past and looking forward to the future. And so kind of creating that mental oh uh, balance in your February room. So I love that. Yeah. And it's important because it's really dark and dreary. Everybody yeah. wants to move to Montana, but then in February, you got to go to the Bahamas. You got to go talk to fish. You got to go yes. bone fishing. You got to get out. So what we're doing here, I just drizzled a little bit of nice quality olive oil on top. And then I'm going to top with some capers. Chop, and I just like fine chop the capers. Again, we're adding that brine. And when this all gets baked, it just adds this wonderful sauce component to this dish. So, and, and we're cooking the fish, it's absorbing all of those wonderful brininess and, and so forth from all of the jalapenos and the, and the capers and so forth. Now I'm just gonna drizzle some white wine over the top because you always need a little moisture. And then we're gonna cover this. We're gonna cover it with tin foil and put it in the oven. It's gonna take about 15 minutes covered and then we're gonna take it out, remove the foil and cook it for another 10 minutes uncovered. So let's get this in the oven, come back while we get the, everything else cooking and plated and put together. Let's get that fish fair cruise out of the oven. I can smell it, the aromas are wonderful, right? Oh, it smells <laughs> so amazing, I'm super excited. Yes. It's nice and bubbling. Look at that. I'm hungry too, so it's Good. perfect. This is a dish that you've never had. No, I've never had this. Normally, Justin and I bonk the pike, take it home, and eat <laughs> pike tacos. So that's like the, the only dish, and I'm, I'm trying to remember all the steps that you're doing here so I can try and, but you know, Justin's the cook at our house. Is he really? wild game cook, and. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just I, I eat it all up. I'm like one of those people that have to look at directions, right? And then I, <laughs> I can cook, but I'm just not like, like this. You're just like, it's awesome. Throwing it. Yeah. So um, one of the things that's so nice about white flaky fish is that it actually can take on so many different flavors. And that's what, what I like doing with different cuisines is bringing in different flavors that are kind of unique. And white flaky fish is one of those that really likes to absorb the flavors. So it's wonderful yeah. to be able to enjoy it. So what I've done here is I just made a cilantro lime rice and I just made some basmati rice. And when you cook rice, you always want to make sure that the, the liquid that you cook it in is flavorful because your rice is absorbing that. So I did a bay leaf and I did some salt and then I finished this, fluffed it with some fresh zested lime zest and then some fresh cut cilantro. So let's dig into this and the best way to do this is just kind of treat it like a, like a little casserole. We're gonna slice this up here. It's helpful that the tomatoes are on top of it so you can kind of figure see. out which one you want. Yes. And I don't know if you know this, but if you get the bay leaf, uh -huh in the culture that is the luck. 
You got the lucky dish. So I'm already lucky right now. You just cooked for me. So I'm on a streak right now. Perfect. <laughs> so yeah, just, you know, take your bay leaf aside and um, dig into that and let me know what you think. Oh yes. And how you enjoy that uh, fish seasoning on there. It smells amazing mm -hmm. though, right? Mmm. <laughs> No more, uh, no more tacos. tacos. This is incredible. <laughs> Wonderful. I love the um, that smoke, but then the Chardonnay and just has a really complex blend with it. It's incredible. Awesome. No more fish tacos. No more fish tacos. No more pike fish tacos. So after we've enjoyed this, where I'm, I'm actually going to get on the river with Justin, and I'm going to get a fly rod lesson with the CD Fishing USA mm -hmm. rod. I'm so excited for that. So thank you for tuning into this episode of Shelley's Game Kitchen. Keep watching while I continue to bring the forest to your table. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. We are here on the Bitter River, and I'm so excited to have Justin with CD Fishing USA here. He's got a fly rod company, and he's gonna actually give me a casting lesson and talk a little bit about the mechanics and, and so forth, because it's an art form. This is, fly fishing is, is really an art form. It's not, you don't go out and just put a bobber down. This is, learning how to cast right makes a huge difference. Yes? Well, yeah, and uh, you know, even beyond being an art form, it's, uh, it's an athletic endeavor. So that's why it's so much fun and people get so into it because you can never really master this. And you're always learning more and learning more and learning more and adjusting things based sure. on, you know, ever-changing conditions out here too. So Yeah, because we're, we're battling the wind and, and you always know. Always wind. <laughs> yep. Battling always the wind. rushing river and the trees. There's all kinds of different aspects that really make this athletic and I was explaining earlier because one of the times that I went fly fishing I was overworking I was overcasting and doing way too much so by the end of the day my shoulder and everything was just exhausted and sore so I would love to hear kind of what I need to do better and what I'm doing wrong and how I can fix it so sure give us a little lesson Justin you bet yeah so as you mentioned um, you know the fatigue usually comes from 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 flaws in your form. Um, and if you do this casting motion right, this rod will do most of the work for you. Oh, nice. So um, yeah, modern fly rods are kind of marvels of technology. They're built with, um, you know, components and materials now that are designed to um, transfer energy throughout the casting stroke, so. And that makes a difference too on the feel when you get a fish that hits, right? The, the technology in the rod being able to feel that better. Because I was For asking sure. Lauren a little yep. bit, what's her favorite rod of your guys' that, that she fly fishes with? Loaded question. Yeah, yeah. well, and, and her response was because of the reaction and the, and the feel of it. Yeah. So we'll get into that a little bit more, but let, yep. let's, see a, let's see a proper cast and let's see how I do it. <laughs> okay, so we've got a little practice fly on here to hopefully keep us from hooking ourselves in this slight wind. And the casting stroke, you know, first of all, the number one thing that I that I tell folks right out of the gate is is the wrist. So this is not breaking your wrist a bunch and this is a natural thing that people do almost every time when they pick up a fly rod. Yes, you break the wrist and you're not supposed to do that. Yeah, and I think it comes from other um, athletic sports like, you know, from ping pong to yep. to tennis to golf, whatever, but golf's always a good analogy. A lot of fly anglers play golf as well, so. And you, you, know, have, and a, you have a trick to try and help people not I break do. their wrists. When, when, when I do, when I teach uh, a beginner, I, I have them put the, um, the butt of the rod in their sleeve. Ah. So that's going to help you from breaking your wrist. <laughs> okay. And so that's kind of where we start. Like, like we want to get them to where they're not breaking their wrist. And the motion, you know, there's several good analogies for this, but um, you know, a paintbrush is one that a lot of casting instructors use. So if you were going to splatter paint against a wall and throw paint from here to a wall 10 feet away, okay. 
To do that, you would snap your wrist at the end, right? Correct. So that's the same thing with the casting scrub. So oh. you're using your forearm primarily. Okay. Another good analogy that I use for that is like you were hammering a nail into a wall. So okay. this is your arm mechanics and then your wrist is gonna snap at the end. And that little ah. bit of snap on both the back cast and the front cast really loads up the rod and, um, and okay. is the, the final tool to the, to the casting stroke that's gonna help you lay out the line straight, get more distance and keep everything clean and smooth. Okay, and, perfect. And when you see, you know, uh, accomplished uh, fly casters, which that's somebody that's squandered a lot of their life on the water. <laughs> um, but when you see, uh, you know, somebody that's done this a lot and, and, and or, you know, guided, the shape of their casting loop, you can tell right away, you know, where their mechanics are. Okay. So the loop, the line unfurling, um, generally you want that to be kind of nice and tight and clean. So it's, you know, it's, it's a, a pretty thing to watch. Yes. Um, but you see how that loop unfurls. Yes. So, and to achieve that loop, that that wrist motion that I mentioned where you're, you know, splattering the paint really keeps that loop nice and tight. And that tight loop is aerodynamic. Okay. And so I'm going to hand this over to you and we're Perfect. in a touchy, you know, a little precarious spot here, but um, go ahead and take that when you're okay. ready. And so this is your line hand. If you're left-handed, your right hand's your line hand, but you're always hanging on to the line in your, in your, in left, your left or right hand. hand. Yeah. yeah until you deliver the fly. Okay. Okay, good. Yep. Nice, so you're timing, wait a wait moment more. longer on the back cast. Yeah, there you go. You gotta think of the fly rod like a bow and arrow. So once that bow is bent and loaded, then you release that arrow. There you, you go, nice. See, now you've got a loop shape building there. That's good. Okay. Yep. Nice. Yep, good. See, you've got a nice you got a nice casting stroke. You're not breaking your wrist. Okay. That's awesome. Yep. No, that looks good. Does I mean, it? You're okay. ready to ready you're to, ready to ready throw to start. a dry fly and go put a boat on. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Good. Well, I know and I love that whole the, the the tricks of understanding, you know, where to actually cast your your loop. Yep. And way the, to scosh longer on that back cast. There you go. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I like it. Okay, I'm gonna hand this over to the master. Okay. And then let's go upstream a little bit and uh, watch a master actually cast out and, and so forth and I'm see how this up. actually works. So I'm going to have Justin kind of take over and tell us a little bit what we have here with these rods from CD Fishing USA. You've got different rods here, so tell me about how those all work and, and the benefits of the different weights and, and so forth of the rods. Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, our, our company, we're, we're similar to a fly shop. So okay. when you walk into a fly shop, you see various models with different price tags on them. And, you know, uh, rods are designed for different applications and different skill levels. So this rod... Beginner. <laughs> right, so the, the beginner's rod was that one that you were casting earlier. Okay. But, you know, that's not just for beginners. I use those all the time myself, especially okay. with my guiding. So it depends um, on the application of where, it doesn't... Yes, okay. so that rod has a nice, what we call like mid flex. And what that means is where does this rod bend up and down the blank. Okay. So this rod is a faster action rod, and that's the term that the fly fishing industry uses. So this rod flexes about here. Okay. And that rod that you were casting would flex somewhere in here. Okay. So the action um, in where the rod flexes um, will dictate um, a number of things, one of them being how easy it is for a beginner to cast. Okay. So a faster action rod requires mechanics. And if your mechanics are good, the fast action rod 
is what you want. Okay, so because for most I'm a beginner having that medium action yep. that's more in the mid is going to be easier for me to actually be able to learn better from and, and have better uh, reaction on, on the water. Correct. Okay. Correct. And also with that, um, the graphite that it's made out of differs based on the rod as well. So this rod is our, our kind of flagship, you know, fast action rod called the XLS2. And this is made out of a graphite that is a uh, high modulus is the term that the industry uses. Okay. But basically modulus just refers to the stiffness of the graphite in layman's terms. Okay. So this graphite is lighter and, and stronger in some regards um, than the graphite that the rod that you were using was, was made out of. Okay. Um, so that also, you know, affects the price tag and there's nicer components on it. This rod's very lightweight. Um, very high performance. Nice. And, and what an you awesome were... dry fly rod. Okay, perfect. And what you were saying too is that you're one of the only companies that has this full setup all in one sort of a package. Is that? No. So that, that rod that we were casting earlier is our kit. Okay, and that's what it was. Every company has a kit. Okay. Our kit has um, a fully machined aluminum reel that comes with it. Oh. Most of the kits come with a cask reel that's relatively inexpensive, and I'm not poo pooing those. Yep, yep. Um, they work just fine just for most applications. Can, yeah. It's just a higher grade reel that we offer on our kit. Okay. And so that's a reel that you could take saltwater fishing because it's going to be corrosion resistant. Uh -huh. And it has a strong enough Perfect. drag system that you could take it from a trout river to a bonefish flat. Okay. Nice. Yep. Well, and you have another rod here. Let's see how that one. This looks. rod is right here. I'll have yes. you hold on to that one. And uh, this rod is a really unique, unique tool. This one obviously has been well used. This is my personal one. I've been fishing with it for about five years and I've taken it um, to the Bahamas. It's been to Florida. It's been a lot of places all over the West. I use it all the time. So different weighted fish or different size of fish you use kind of... You well, know. you'll see in a minute what this thing does. This is kind of like um, a multi-tool of okay. fly rods. So we have this handy little clip on here that helps keep the tri-folding magnetic rod tube in place. Oh, I love that. So we have this tri-folding magnetic rod tube and within this, within the rod tube on the same butt section, you can switch this from a 7-8 weight, okay. which would be a heavier rod that you might use for pike. Oh, okay. Yep. For we instance. Did, yeah, yeah. We, we yep. actually were just cooking pike with, with your wife, Lauren. We just had oh, a wonderful... Oh, you didn't let what, her cook, did you? What, she helped. You know, she... She'll she, sous chef for you a little bit. <laughs> there you but go. I wouldn't I wouldn't put her in the head chef <laughs> she, role. She enjoyed it wonderfully. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that this is kind of what you would catch the pike on and, and so forth, so... Yep, and then and then what this rod does is, is it also has a 5-6 component. Okay. So you could put this together and use it as a trout rod like that, or you could turn it into a seven, eight weight and throw bigger flies for pike, big brown trout, okay. bone fish, whatever you were um, in search of. Um, and the other really cool thing that it does is most fly rods are nine feet. This one you can make 10 feet. Oh, wow. So you can add this extender, turn it into a 10 foot rod. So the benefit of having a 10 foot would not be here where there's a ton of uh, brush and trees on the side. You would, you, is that correct? No, a 10 foot has applications here. Okay. So yep, for sure. Um, and I don't, I don't want to muddy the waters up too much, but some <laughs> anglers really like 10 foot rods. Okay, okay. And, but not um, a beginner like me. No, it would have some applications for you, but, <laughs> but what I use it primarily for, and this is the really cool thing, is you can screw in the second handle. And now this rod becomes what's called a switch rod. And with a switch rod, I can use two hands and use those casts that I was just demonstrating here to gain distance. But with two hands, I can cast much further. Oh. And you mentioned fatigue earlier. Yes. 
This that is a very butt. low fatigue method of fly casting. Yeah. You can have that so, longer butt to where you're not breaking No, your you're wrist actually and... using two hands. Oh, that's So your the, oh. bottom hand is actually your power hand. Okay. As opposed to the traditional single-handed rod where your your top hand's going to be your power hand. Gotcha. This is this is a little different program, but it's oh extremely gosh. effective and and swinging flies for trout is uh, an increasingly popular um, technique for pursuing them because okay. it's super fun. You can do it anywhere, even in this high water right here. If I were going to come out here and fish today uh, in earnest, um, you could either throw a nymph or you could swing flies. And the swinging flies to me is more enjoyable because I, I like the casting aspect of it. And when a fish grabs the, the swung fly on a tight line, it's quite a sensation yeah. because you feel it immediately. And, um, you get that reaction immediate. You want to, you know, yeah, they set call, the hook. They, they call it the tug is the drug. Okay, the so, tug is the drug. Yeah. I like that. That's yeah. fantastic. Well, Justin, this has been so informative and so helpful. I think I've, I've, I've really kind of improved my technique a little bit with your instruction and, and definitely learned a lot more about this beautiful artistic form. And it's so famous here in Western Montana. I mean, we fly fish. It, it, everybody comes here from all over the world to fly fish. So it's just an amazing art and, and pastime and, and actually, like you said, an athletic, um, you know, activity. Mm -hmm. So while we go out, why don't you tell us a little bit, you got a supply of flies here, but explain why you would use different ones for different times of, of year. Sure. So what we have coming up here, once the river drops back into shape here in the coming weeks, we're going to see hatches of salmon flies and stone flies. And this is a big event that uh, a lot of folks that Shelly mentioned come here to try and fish this uh, famed stone fly hatch. And you know, the, the stone fly hatch is unique because Absolutely. there's not too many places where you can fish a dry fly this big and have trout come up and eat it. Uh, it's kind of a Rocky Mountain thing. And uh, this box right here is primarily comprised of flies that are going to imitate the giant salmon fly, um, the golden stone. So you can see, I mean, this one's a, a, an extremely big one, but um, throwing that dry fly down this river and having a big trout come up and eat it is a pretty cool experience. Absolutely. Well, and I love yeah. the, the color. That's what I need the, the more colorful ones to be able to see when the, when the trout hits my fly. <laughs> well, it's interesting too, because, uh, you know, I guided in Oregon and we fished salmon flies out there, but they were, they were smaller and they were more orange. And once I uh, started fishing this river, I got uh, turned on to purple. Okay. And purple is, was kind of devised on the bitterroot for trout. Okay. Um, by a local guide here. And now you'll see purple in trout flies all across the country. Is that John? Uh, actually, his name is Andy Carlson. Okay. Because yep. uh, John was a, a very famous fly fishing guide here, and we lost him a few years ago. But uh, he pr he was probably in that same club. I'm yep. guessing he just didn't get the full credit for yeah, it or something. So but wonderful. Um, and then and then we have some subsurface flies here. Um, oftentimes we fish nymphs. Um, the fish feed subsurface most of the time. Okay. Um, so to imitate the bugs that they eat, we use little weighted flies and bigger weighted flies. These are the nymphs of that giant salmon fly I was just showing you. Okay. So that's a big chunk of protein. Yes, it is. But, um, you know, the standard day in, day out nymphs are a little smaller. Okay. And, uh, you know, like I have that rigged up, a dry dropper system is very popular where you put a larger dry fly on that'll float and hold up a nymph. And then the dry fly not only functions as a fish attractant, but also as a strike indicator, basically. Okay, so right. when you see that go down, you know a fish yeah. may have taken your nymph. Yep, there you yep. go. And Wonderful. then we have some smaller mayflies, lots of mayflies on the bitterroot. Um, so this box is designed to imitate mayflies that hatch throughout the season. And this is another dry fly box um, with, with different, uh, different bugs in it, grasshoppers in here, beetles, ants, and, uh, and then squala stoneflies, which are popular on this river. Perfect. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Justin. It's been such a pleasure to uh, kind of visit with you and learn a lot more about not only CD Fishing USA, but also your techniques and, and so forth. So I appreciate you taking the time out and joining me today. So thanks for tuning in to this episode of Shelly's Game Kitchen. I can't wait to show you a few more things at the next episode when I continue to bring the forest to your table. 
Awesome, thank you, Shelly. Thank you. Yep. Montana Flavor to Savor. We've spent decades creating the best flavors for you to enjoy. All natural, no preservatives, gluten-free. No fillers, just flavor. You can trust Montana Flavor to Savor to bring you wholesome, all natural seasonings for whatever you're creating in your cuisine. Go to MontanaFlavorToSavor.com today.